I want to talk to you on this topic today, the humanity of Christ, part three. Here we go. We need each other's testimony. Now, in part one, I said of this series, just recap real quick for anybody who's here for Easter, and I understand a lot of guests, and here we are expecting to be, you know, right into this part three. Don't worry about it. You can see those in YouTube, youtube.com slash waterschurch. But today, I want to just give you a real quick recap. recap. The humanity of Christ teaches us how to be human. How do I do humanity? How many know that it's hard to be human? Yeah, it's not, there's no instruction manual, is there? There is someone we can look to, Jesus the Christ. He was fully human, and he lived amongst us, and he walked amongst us, and he was tempted like us. He knows how it feels. So if you've ever been struggling, there's good news in the gospel. We've got a person in heaven who's been there. He's done that. He knows, and he can help you. And we talked about in week one that the first thing that he did was he formed a community. He formed a group. He called some people to follow him, and we said, we need each other. That was part one. We need each other. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. Turn to your second choice and say, and you too. Last week we talked about the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying, sweating drops of blood. He's overwhelmed with the fact that he's going to the cross. He's bearing the sins of the world. He, pray, he asks for prayer, partners in prayer. Jesus, God the Son, asks for partners in prayer. We need each other's prayers. We need, I, need, I need you to pray for me. I, I pray for you. We pray for each other. That's the part of why we're saying so much this weekend on Easter Get into a life group. Get, step up to life group leadership because so many people, they're going through so many different challenges. They don't know what to do. Well, we're here to help each other. We're here to pray for each other. I don't know about you, but when I get in together with other people and pray, my prayers are elevated, and to know that other people are praying for me elevates my life. We need each other's prayers, but number three, we need each other's testimony. First Corinthians chapter 15, that's where we're gonna go in just a moment. I wanna bring it to the empty grave, though. John chapter 20 is the moment that happened 2,000 years ago that we're celebrating right now, where the scripture says that in the early morning, Mary and the other Mary, this is Mary Magdalene, and there's another woman named Mary, not Jesus' mother Mary, there's another Mary. Very common name, named for Moses' sister Miriam. That's where the name comes from. Very common Jewish name. So they go to the tomb early in the morning. It's still dark. This is John chapter 20. And they notice that the tomb is open. The grave, the, the, the stone has been rolled away, and They're shocked by this. They did not expect this. No one that was following Jesus, even though he told them several times, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again, they did not get it. It never registered in their heads. And so they go to the tomb and there's nobody. So Mary immediately leaves. She's shocked. She's bewildered. She runs to the disciples. She tells Peter, look, we went to the tomb. It's open and there's no body there. And uh, the disciples are shocked too. So, so Peter and another disciple run to the tomb and they poke their head in just for a moment and they say, oh my, no, he's not there. So they, they walk away. And, and now picking up the story in verse 11, check out what happens. Uh, Mary brought the disciples, the disciples look in and they go away. Verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. How many know women like to investigate? <laughs> it's like your spiritual gift, ladies. We thank God for that sometimes. We thank God for that. My wife needs details. She likes details. I say, we went to the store. We had this conversation. We left. What'd you talk about? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. What'd they say? What'd you say? How many times did they blink? How many times? What were they wearing? What was their color of the shirt? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't realize that I was giving, you know, legal testimony in a court of law, but I will do better next time, honey. Women love to investigate. Thank God for you women. Love you. But she's, insta- she's like investigating. What? Let's just check again. She sees an angel. Now two angels, actually. And they say, woman, why are you weeping? The word for weeping here is the Greek word for the strongest kind of crying you can do. She's not just teary-eyed. She's bawling her eyes out. She's distraught. She is broken up. And then she says, she says to the, to the angels, they, um, verse 13, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. I don't know where he is. Now, the reason why she was distraught was because in those days, somebody who was crucified, in order to, the the Romans, they were very vicious. And sometimes to to be uh, extra vicious to a crucified victim, they wouldn't allow a proper burial. They would either just let them hang on the cross until they were deteriorated, or they would throw their bodies onto a garbage dump in the Kidron Valley in the south portion of the city of Jerusalem. It was called Gehenna. 
Jesus talks about that when he re references hell. He says it's like Gehenna. And in that area, there was a, a fire that never stopped burning because people would just throw their garbage there and there were bodies there too. This was a gross place. So she's distraught because she thinks maybe somebody came, took the body and threw him on the garbage. Tea. I mean, talk about insult to injury. She's already lost her savior. She's already lost her Lord. And now she thinks he's, he's deteriorating physically somewhere in a, in a, in a, in a, in a heinous place. And, and, and then and she turns from the angels and Jesus is there. And she doesn't recognize him. And she doesn't know it's Jesus. And, and he says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? And the Bible says she thought he was the gardener. She thought he was, so she says uh, in, in verse uh, 15, she says, Lord, just uh, tell me where you put him and I'll go take care of it. And then Jesus decides, okay, now time to reveal. Big reveal, verse 16. And Jesus said to her, Mary, I love this. Look at the tenderness of our Savior. Look at the tenderness of Jesus. And let me just say to somebody here on Easter Sunday 2024, can I tell you, he knows your name. He knows your name. This is so beautiful. This is the picture of our Savior Jesus. He rises from the grave and he sees Mary and she's just weeping, tears in her eyes, just bawling her eyes out. What has happened to my Lord? Mary. And look at, she turned to him and said in Aramaic, that was the common language of the day. That's what Jesus spoke, Aramaic. Ravani, and there's an exclamation point because she shouts it. And this woman was the first person to realize that the grave was not the end for Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a beautiful moment. I mean, I don't know if you can understand the magnitude of this moment. You've walked with this guy. You've followed this guy for three years. You've seen him raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. And then you saw him brutally murdered on a cross three days earlier. And you thought the movement was over and you thought it was all done. And you are weeping and bawling your eyes out. And then suddenly you come face to face with Jesus himself on the other side of all of this. Talk about your joy coming back. Talk about getting happiness in your heart. Talk about just this moment of emotional transition. I don't think anyone could possibly really encapsulate the way she was just transitioned from sadness to everlasting joy. Verse 17, do not cling to me. Like, whoa, cold water, Jesus. I mean, let her hold on for a little while, huh? Think of what she's been through. But look what he says. This is powerful. I never saw this before. Don't hold on to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go and tell my brothers that I am ascending to the Father. This was priority one in Jesus' mind on Easter Sunday. Here, here's what the priority was. I need you to tell somebody I'm alive. And I want you to think about this today. We're all here. And all I'm doing is telling you that somebody who is dead is alive. That's the movement of Jesus. Now, if I was Jesus on resurrection morning, forgive me. I'm going to get in the flesh a little bit here, okay? I would have done it differently. I would have woke up resurrection morning and I would have kicked that rock out of my way. I would have walked out and I would have just, with like Superman laser vision, pow, pow, to the guards. Then I would have showed up at Pilate's house and said, stinks to be you, Pilate. I'm back, baby. You know what I'm talking? I'm talking full Terminator style. I am on a mission. And I, if I was you, I would have come out of that grave with a can in my hand that I was going to open on every man that tried to hurt me. But Jesus doesn't do that. Here was his priority. I need you to tell somebody. And everybody who's ever heard the gospel and everybody who's ever believed that Jesus rose again does so, think about this, because somebody told them. We need each other's testimony. Here's something else. I need you to tell me again that Jesus is alive. Anybody like me, sometimes I forget Sometimes I forget he's alive. Anybody? Can I be honest? Can I can preacher be honest this morning? Because when I am on the road and somebody drives slowly in front of me, <laughs> inordinately slowly, I mean, you know that the speed limit is the speed suggestion, right? That's the suggested speed for people who have no place to go. That's what that speed is. In those moments, if I'm honest, I forget that Jesus is alive. 
And then there's times when I'm angered by real things. Like, that's not a real thing. But real things. Or I look on the news and I see the tragedies and I, I watch the heartaches and the, and the evil and I see what's happening to, you know, the world and I watch, you know, injustice win or I see leaders fail or, you know, uh, government do what government does, which is basically nothing. And, and, and I just get so angry and I say, and, and in those moments, if I'm like you, if you're like me, I forget that Jesus is alive. I do. Because I, my, my, my mind and my soul have been morphed back to earth and I gotta remind myself and I need you to remind me and we need to remind each other that Jesus is still alive. I'm talking to somebody, 2024 has been a bad year so far. Got good news for you. Jesus is still alive. The grave is still empty. He's still at the right hand side of God the Father. He still rules and reigns. He's still got a purpose and a plan and he's not done with you yet. We need to be reminded. So here's what I want you to write down in your notes. If Jesus told people to tell people he's alive, I need people to tell me that Jesus is alive. That's a, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but it's worth writing down because I forget. The Corinthians forgot. The Corinthians are the church that the book I just read from is written to. It's not a book, it's a letter. Paul the apostle writes this book, this letter, 1 Corinthians, to a church in Corinth in the first century. That's why it's called Corinthians. It was a letter, and, and, and the reason why he write, wrote to this church is because the church was messed up. The church forgot the gospel. It, and uh, I like going to 1 Corinthians in my Bible because when you read 1 Corinthians, you see what Paul has to deal with in that church. He's writing a letter of instruction to a, a church just like us, just like us. Let me tell you something. Our church is, our church is not perfect, but this one... <laughs> I mean, this one wins the award for the most dysfunctional church in the New Testament. They were divisive. They were sexually immoral. There was a guy in the church sleeping with his father's wife. It's just gross. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Have you ever, have you ever wondered where that was? And Paul's like, this is bad. Even the pagans think you're crazy. You've got to stop this. In chapter 6, he tells us you've got to stop bringing each other to court, suing each other. They were suing each other. Imagine this. In chapter 7, he talks about the fact that they were giving up on their marriages. In chapter uh, 11, you get to that chapter, he says, look, um, when, when you take the Lord's Supper, can you all just kind of get along? When you come to the communion table, if you're Catholic, when you come to the Eucharist table, he said, hey, can you just, some of you guys, when you come, this is what he says to them, when you come, you drink so much of the cup, you get drunk. Could you imagine that? Somebody come to the community and be like, all right, Jesus, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> this is what's happening in the first century church in Corinth. This is a messed up church. Chapter 12, they're all chaotic in their services, and people are speaking out of, tongue, out of line in tongues, and people are, you know, shouting from the audience in crazy ling language. He's like, you've got to stop doing that too. Chapter 13, that great passage of love that we read at weddings is because they didn't have love for each other. That's why he wrote it. Chapter 14, they were elevating each other based on their spiritual gift. My spiritual gift is more important than your spiritual gift. And, and Paul's like, no, everybody in the body matters. And then go all the way back to the gospel in chapter 15. Verse 1 of chapter 15. Look what the first words are. Now I would what? Remind you, could be that this church was so jacked up because they forgot that Jesus was alive. Let me make it more personal. Could be that your family is so jacked up because you forgot that Jesus is alive. Could be, because, could be your marriage is where it's at right now because you forgot that Jesus is alive. Could be you, you, you're struggling with the same stuff and the same issues and the same heartache right now because you forgot that Jesus is alive. Because if he's alive, he's not done. If he's alive, there's hope. If he's alive, your trouble is just a tunnel. And there's a light at the end. And the light is the return of Jesus Christ. You gotta know this. You gotta get this back into your spirit because it's easy to forget. Is anybody like me? Do you get in your own head sometimes? Does anybody get in their own head? You know what I'm talking about? Hey, let, let me tell you what the real pandemic was. Are you ready? Loneliness. Social distancing. I'm so glad it's all over. And you're all like shoulder to shoulder today. Amen. It's good to be back to that. Praise God. But I, I remember just a couple months ago hearing they came out and they said, yeah, you know the whole six feet distance thing? We made it up. Just made it up. These are the experts making stuff up. Yeah, it sounds right. And all we know from that point now, after all the studies and all the research shows us, we jacked ourselves up with all this stuff. 
We're not made to be separated. You are made for community. You're made to have people that you know, that know you, that love you, that face you, that, that walk with you, that pray with you, that do life. And sometimes you need somebody to remind you when you're acting like a spoiled brat and you think the world's falling apart, you need somebody to come alongside you. Hey, 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 the gospel's still real. Jesus is still alive. God's not done yet. The best is yet to come. I need somebody to do that for me. You know, I spend a lot of time alone. That's why I say I get in my own head. I spend a lot of time alone. It's not good. It's not good. There, there, there's, there's a prison in, in Japan. I just read this earlier this week. There's a prison in Japan. It has quadrupled in population in the last five years, quadrupled, and mostly amongst the inmates, 62 years old and older. Bunch of old people going to prison in Japan right now. And they, and they found out why. <laughs> You'll never believe this. Old people in Japan are so lonely that they will commit petty crimes so that they can get thrown into prison because they're that alone. At least they have company in prison. That's crazy to me. You know what it means? It means that loneliness is worse than prison. Some of you are there right now. You don't have Christian friends. You don't have anybody that locks arms with you, lifts you up, prays for you, builds you up, and you have a chance to build them up and think of somebody other than you. And and this is such a a healing medication for some of you. Some of you, you you, you don't even realize. You see, that the drug company will never prescribe this because they can't make money off of it. But people helping people is what we're made to do. The gospel goes forward when people connect to people. People tell people. Somebody talks to somebody else. Do you have people in your life that will talk to you about Jesus still being on the throne? Because if not, this is your Sunday to walk out of our sanctuary into our lobby and sign up for a life group. Sign up to get involved. Not just some of you are here. It's it's Easter and you're just doing this thing again. You're just doing this. You're tapping your toe into the water. It's Waters Church. It's Waters Church. So you're just, you're tapping. This is what you do. And every Christmas, you do it too. You're like, Christmas, oh, baby Jesus, amen. Tap, tap, tap. And then, oh yeah, Easter Sunday, that's right, he's alive. Tap, tap, tap. I'm asking you to just jump into the deep end of the pool and enjoy all that God has to give you through the community of faith. We'll forget. We get into our heads. There's a community in, in Israel, the Rahadim community. And they are a very strict, orthodox, religious sect of Jews. They are 12% of the population. And they live on a steady diet, you'll never believe this, of cream, sugar, and butter. Amen. That's my love language, dietarily. Anybody with me on that? That's my love language. And, you know, accordingly, they are also some of the most obese people in Israel. (laughs) And so you would think that because of that, they wouldn't live long. Au contraire. This group lives longer than their secular, non-Orthodox Jewish counterparts. Do you know why? They found out because they get together and they fellowship and they have community and they're tight-knit and they focus so much on being together. It literally extends their lives. Hey, better than a diet can. Oh, that's so good. (laughs) I'm about to give somebody some great Easter news. Are you ready? I'm about to make your day. If you get into Christian community, you can eat whatever you want (laughs) and still live a long time. (laughs) What else proof do we need than from the last four years and all the way to this moment to realize that, man, we're not made to do life alone. And the gospel ministry of spreading the word happens not through visible signs in the sky or, you know, miracles bringing up. You know, the atheist scorns and says, I'll believe when I see something supernatural. Man, every sunrise is supernatural. Every day I have breath. Have you ever heard a baby laugh? Man, it's gorgeous. It's wonderful. I mean, this is the beauty of our world. And they all point to a beautiful God who made it and is bringing it back to himself. So God does not win people to himself through visible signs in the sky. This is how it goes. People tell people that Jesus is alive. And just like the first, Corinth, first century church of Corinth, sometimes I need people to remind me that Jesus is alive. And if you're honest today, you do too. Three points and then we're done. Write this down. Number one, because of the resurrection, I have a hopeful determination. Because of the resurrection, 
Paul, Paul's going to make a point here in this chapter. I can get through whatever I'm going through. I have a hopeful determination. I can't be stopped. I wonder what's stopping some of you. Mom died. Grandma died. Somebody left you. Somebody abandoned you. Somebody betrayed you. Man, life is difficult, challenging. It hurts. And Paul says this. In the, at first, he argues from the negative in, the, in verse 13. He, he's talking to them because the Corinthians actually started to disbelieve in the resurrection. They thought it was already over. Or it was just spiritual. Or it wasn't going to happen at all. So in verse 13, it says this. He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ, look at this. And if Christ has not been raised, then you are, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. In other words, he's saying, if there is no resurrection, there's no point to this movement. He goes on. He says, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ are paired, they're dead, they're dead and gone. And then verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, the, the, the Christian movement hinges on the resurrection. It hinges on the resurrection. Why? Because this life's gonna challenge you. This life's gonna pinch you. This life's gonna disappoint you, and you're gonna get beaten down. What keeps you going? The resurrection. This is not the end. I can press forward in Christ Jesus. Later in verse 30, he says, why are we in danger every hour? Paul's making this personal point. He says, look, why do I go through what I'm going through? He says, I die every day. I die every day. I get hostility, Paul says. I get hostility against me every day. And he says, I fought wild beasts at Ephesus. He's talking about people there. How many got some beasts in their own lives? <laughs> he says, I fought these wild beasts in Ephesus. And I did all that. And I pressed through. And if the dead are not raised, then all of this is useless and worthless. But because of the resurrection, I can keep walking forward in my life. Paul, by the way, struggled intensely for the gospel. If you have a Bible, you want to go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us what he struggled, for, how he struggled through the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, listen to the list of persecutions from Paul the apostle. He writes in verse 24, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. In other words, on five different occasions, Paul the apostle was whipped 39 times. How do you get through that if there wasn't a resurrection? He says, three times I was beaten with rods. He goes, once I was stoned. Not, not, that's not the, that's the people's chucking rocks at your head. Stone. Because some of you might read that like, I'd get stoned too if that was me. I'd just, I'd just tell you. He was stoned. Rocks were chucked at his head. And then he goes, um, three times I was shipwrecked. Three times? You know, some, some Christians lose their faith if their cruise is late. Come on, somebody. <laughs> this guy was shipwrecked, not once, not twice, three times. He goes, I spent a night and a day at a drift to sea. And then he goes just on a litany. Listen to this litany. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger, thirst, without food, in cold exposure. And apart from all that, I have on my heart the daily anxiety that I have for all the churches in Christ. This is a man who suffered and was persecuted and was hunted down and hated. So you get the idea here. What got him through? The hope of the resurrection. And let me tell you something. You got to get reminded that there's a resurrection or you'll let this world drag you into the depths of despair. I got good news for somebody in this house. You might be walking into the valley of the shadow of death, but I don't care how dark it gets because Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. We're coming out of that valley of the shadow of death. His rod and his staff are comforting us, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever in Jesus' mighty name. That's our hope. Matthew Henry said that men, men have enough religion to, to live by, but they don't have enough religion to die by. In other words, I know I can, I can get through even death because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing, but the, um, the temperature is getting turned up on Christian persecution in this country. In this country. Don't blame me for this next few moments in my sermon. 
But our president just announced that today isn't Easter Sunday. It's National Transgender Visibility Day. Yeah, you didn't hear about that because the news wants you to think that he's still Catholic. He's about as Catholic as Donald Trump is evangelical. This is our government taking the holiest Christian day of the year and destroying the sentiment through absolute confusion. But this is where the country will continue to go. The question is, will you still stand? I got enough Jesus, I'm willing to die for it. And it might get to that point. I, I don't think in my lifetime, but I think it'll get to that point. That's, it might be good for the church, by the way, too. Kind of separates the wheat from the chaff. Kind of separates the real believers, the true believers from the false believers. That you can stand there and say, if you take my life, I don't care because Christ holds my life in the palm of his hands and no one's plucking me out. But then I saw on, on X, this is the, you know, formerly Twitter. This was, <laughs> I couldn't believe this when this happened a couple of weeks ago. The, the words, Christ is king, started to go viral. Christ is king. I thought, oh, wow, cool. Christ is king. Amen. So I started to check it out. Turns out the only reason why it went viral is because some, some moron living in his parents' basement decided to say that the term Christ is king is actually anti-Semitic and we shouldn't say it. Uh, what? <laughs> this, is the, this is the lunacy of our age. You, you, you understand that we have people in the streets of America every single week um, chanting pro-Hamas ideologies, pro-terrorist ideologies, sympathizing with terrorists who raped and murdered and pillaged Jewish people a couple months ago. And, 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 and that's fine. But people who say Christ is king on social media are suddenly anti-Semitic. Talk about missing the forest for the trees. Let me just say something emphatically on Easter Sunday, 2024. Christ is king. He's king of the Jews. He's king of the Gentiles. He's king of the atheists. He's king of the agnostics. He's king of you. He's king of me. You don't even have to acknowledge that he's king because my Bible says he's king of kings and he's Lord of lords and every tongue's going to confess and every knee's going to bow. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the truth. I don't have to convince you of that. That's the truth that God has pro 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 proclaimed in his word. So, I was thinking about that term too, Christ is king. He's not just king of us, he's king of the cosmos. He's king of Jupiter. Like he's the one that gets to decide if Pluto is actually a planet or not. That's, <laughs> amen? It's Easter Sunday. Some of you say, I don't understand why Easter Sunday is always a different day of the year. Why is that the case? Okay, I got, I got, I got to give you a little information about that because I just learned this myself. Um, it's actually a cosmic ordering and I think it make, makes perfect sense. You know, Jesus' birth was announced by a star. And the cosmos bore witness to Christ coming to earth. Well, the church, many centuries ago, decided we got to align his resurrection with the cosmos. And the reason why Easter is a moving date, it can go from March 22nd to April 29th, anytime between then, is because officially they wait until the days get starting to get longer. And then they wait and I just found this out last week, that Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So, technically speaking, you should be saying to each other, happy first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. <laughs> but because that doesn't fit on a Hallmark card, we just call it Easter, amen? And, and what I'm trying to tell you, though, is that even the cosmos points to Jesus. He's king over all. And then Isaiah 57, verse 15. This is why this matters. Because it says this in Isaiah. I'm the high and lofty one. I dwell in a high and lofty place. But also. Somebody say, but also. Check this out. The king of the cosmos also dwells with the one who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive them. You know, what scripture says about Jesus is that he feels all in all. He fills all in all. That means he fills the cosmos and he can fill your heart and he can help you press on because in the resurrection you have, you have a holy determination in Jesus Christ. Point number two, because of the resurrection I have a heavenly destination. I'm just a pilgrim passing through this life. And yeah, this life can have a lot of joys. It can also have a lot of sorrows, but it's not home. It's not home. 
Here's, what's, here's the reality for anyone listening to me. I beg you to listen. You are gonna die. You are going to die. I don't care what you believe. You're dead. You're a dead man waiting. And the reason why Paul unpacks here in 1 Corinthians is why the resurrection is so important. In verse 22, he says, as in Adam, all die. All die. The atheist dies. The agnostic dies. The skeptic dies. The Muslim, the Hindu, they all die. But then also in Christ Jesus, all will be made alive. Each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then all who, uh, then all who at his coming who belong to Christ. Now, the reason why we die, Paul says, is because of a, one man. What's that man's name? Adam. What happened in Adam? In the garden, he was in perfect harmony with God. God set down one rule, Genesis chapter 2, 17. And God said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat it, you shall surely what? Die. Now the Hebrew is even deeper. The Hebrew text, the Hebrew translation of that text says, and in dying, you shall die. Think about that phrase. In dying, you shall die. So <laughs> here's the truth. Uh, we're not just gonna die, we are dying. Scientifically, when men turn 21, they stop growing and they start deteriorating. Yeah. Ladies, bad news. It happens even earlier for you. When you turn 18, you stop growing and you start deteriorating. Slowly. <laughs> but it's happening. You have less cells, you have less life in you than you did only one hour ago. <laughs> Happy Easter. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, we want to deny this. It's a reality. Your body is slowly decomposing. Some of you, it's very obvious. Some of you far less. You can, you can cover things up. You know what I'm talking about. Let me pick on me so I don't feel like you're getting poked at, okay? I used to run three miles a day four times a week. I don't anymore. <laughs> My knee says, mm, no, we're not doing that anymore. I got plantar festitis. Anybody with me? I got that over here. If I, if I run for even like 30 seconds, the next morning I wake up, pain, agonizing pain. I've been to two doctors, and they're like, welcome to old age. And, and, and I, this is something else that happens to me. Maybe someone can run. I go to bed healthy. I wake up injured. I don't know, I think my wife is secretly beating me up <laughs> while I sleep. She's probably like, and that's for yesterday, and this is for, I know you're going to blow it. I'm thinking about getting one of those nest cams in my bedroom just to make sure is she, no, she's not. In dying, you shall die. And there ain't nothing you can do to stop it. But if you're born again of the Holy Spirit, that's not the end. And so the scripture says, Adam caused us all to start dying. And you say, I don't like that. That's unfair. Why should I be held accountable for what Adam did? Okay, I get it. That's totally reasonable. But notice how the Bible ends it. And in Christ, all were made alive. One guy got you into it. Good news. One guy gets you out of it. It's, it's, it's equal. The, 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 the plane is equal. Now, now you just put your faith in Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit comes in and, and you're, yeah, your body is still going to die, but your spirit is alive and what, death ha what happens at death, you are just facing a doorway of transition to a new life that will never die. Paul says in verse 51, behold, I tell you a mercy, a, a mystery. Uh, he says, we shall not all sleep. That, that now, now when he talks about death, notice that he says it's sleep. It's not death. It's not an end. It's just sleep. You're just going to take a nap. And you will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable. You will never deal with dying bodies again. Which brings me to point number three. Write this down. Because of the resurrection, I'm bound for bodily transformation. 
transformations in my future. So yeah, National Trans Visibility Day. I'm getting transformed in Jesus' name because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? And this is the hope of our faith. You don't have, you don't have to be um, feeling like you don't belong. Because I thought about this. This is, the, this, is what, this is what everyone struggles with in some way, shape, or form. And if you're honest, and I'm honest, we all know it. I'm not, in a whole, I'm not at home in this body. Anybody with me on that? I'm not, people say, oh, death is a part of life. It's a part of, man, that's just baloney. That's like saying divorce is just a part of marriage. Paul will say in this text, the, the last enemy is death. Death is not natural. It's unnatural. You were not intended to die. You were intended to live with Christ, and your body is betraying that reality every single day. But in Christ Jesus, you're getting a new body. 1 Corinthians 15, 35, he says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised, and what kind of body do they come with? He says, foolish person. Then he then he goes all agricultural on us. He says, when you sow into the ground, you don't, you don't put what comes into the, what comes out of the ground is not, does not look like what comes into the ground. It's a, it's a kernel that dies and then, and then a plant comes up. That's how the resurrection is gonna look. And, I, and, and, and then he says this, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Oh, this is good. This is good. This is why they didn't. Ex this is why they did not recognize Jesus when he rose again. This is why, because he looked different. So, uh, good news for anybody who doesn't look good. It's not your final body. Amen. Might be the best news someone's heard all year. You're getting a heavenly body. Jesus' heavenly body was indestructible, is indestructible. My heavenly body will be indestructible, will not deteriorate. I get to run again, hallelujah. I, I get to rollerblade again. Yeah, I used to rollerblade too, I was a weirdo. Yeah, I get to do all those things. My body will live forever and there will be no disease and there will be no pandemics and there will be no sadness and there will be no death and there will be no loss and there will be no pain and there will be no divorce and there will be no dysfunction. There will just be eternal glory for all eternity in the presence of our almighty God. So happy transformation day in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter three. Jesus said, Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven and we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, here it is, transform our body to be like his glorious body. And then he says this, that's how you stand firm. If the resurrection didn't happen, nothing matters. But because it did, but because it did, you matter. And your pain is not permanent and your trials are just tunnels with a light at the end of them. And God is gonna lead you through and come back here and bring you home. Sermon in a sentence. When I remember the resurrection of Jesus, I'm determined through life's troubles, I'm bound for heaven, and I'll finally be at home in my body. Someone today you came to church, this is for you. Because you're at that place where you don't know who you are or you're struggling with your identity or you're struggling with who God made you and you just feel so disjointed, disconnected. You just don't, don't feel at home. Good, good news that you feel that way because I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer to all of that. But you gotta receive him. You gotta receive him and, and when you receive him, he makes a home in you. And he puts a seed of hope inside your heart. And he brings you through this life to a home eternity, eternally in heaven. We're going to give you a chance to say yes to Jesus today in this room. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes right where you are? And in just a moment, Chris is going to come back out. He's going to give you a chance to say yes to Jesus. I pray that you do. I pray that you do. Father, would you open every heart that needs to respond to Jesus? And today, would you 
by your grace, draw all people to yourself. And may they respond in Jesus' name.